Hi, everybody. Hi. Oh, look at that. I got a reaction. That's great. I can tell you're the best crowd I'm going to have at this, at this event. Also the only crowd, but still the best. So uh, my name is Todd Kerfelman. Uh, thank you for uh, attending uh, this intro talk on Cloud Firestore data modeling. Uh, I am from the Firebase team, as, as maybe you might have guessed. Uh, hey, Firebase, in case you hadn't heard, is a set of tools and services to help you build more successful mobile and web apps. Um, and we do that with everything from like analytics to A-B testing to performance monitoring to, yes, hosting your app data in the cloud with Cloud Firestore, our massively scalable cloud-hosted NoSQL real-time database. So um, in the interest of time, I'm kind of kind of skip the product pitch, because um, I think if you're here at this session, you generally kind of know that Cloud Firestore is awesome. It's got like, yay, reliability and a truly serverless app development environment and magical syncing of your data to all your devices and great offline support and client libraries for iOS, Android, and the web, and much more. Um, but we kind of, you know, we'll breeze over that. Because uh, I know that certainly um, when I'm first approaching any new technology, something that excites me, uh, like, like Cloud Firestore, um, I'm a little bit like our developer here who is apparently working on a food delivery app. Uh, I have this mixture of like, excitement and fear. Right? Like, I'm super excited to use all these great new shiny features and can't wait to see what I can do with it. But I'm also kind of afraid of messing things up. Right? Like, how can I make sure that six months down the road, I've made the right decision so that my database can like, make the right kind of queries that I want it to, or you know, they haven't done something wrong and messed up the performance as soon as my app starts to scale, or I've done something terrible and I you know, have driven up my database costs exponentially. Right? Like, how can I make sure I'm making the right decisions now so that I am not some you know, cautionary tale on Medium later? That's at least generally the feeling I kind of have when I approach a new technology. I'm guessing maybe many of you do as well. I certainly kind of see this sentiment, this like, mixture of excitement and fear, like out on Stack Overflow and, say, on our own um, you know, discussion lists. And to be fair, you know, there's a lot to kind of think about when it comes to sort of how you're structuring your database. And it would be kind of scary stuff here. Um, so let's see if we can shine a light on some of these topics. Um, and I think I'm going to start by just kind of reviewing, in, in case you know, you're, you're new to this, what a NoSQL database is. Um, I think because for a lot of sort of particularly mobile and web developers, this is kind of their first time trying to make like a real production scale app using a NoSQL database. And then you know, we'll get into a few details around how Cloud Firestore is different. So uh, I'm going to assume most of you kind of know what a you know, more typical traditional SQL database is. You've got tables. And each one of these tables represents sort of a, a strictly defined object, something like an author or a book or a review. Um, and you have schemas that have very strict rules around what kind of data is allowed to appear in each one of these columns. Right? Like, you know, that first column in the author's table probably has to be a string that represents their last name, and the second one needs to be an auto-incrementing integer, and the third one has to be a timestamp, and so on and so forth, right? And then later on, you might want to sort of merge bits and pieces of these different tables together to get some data that, that you're interested in, and um, you would do this by writing something in a language called SQL. And, you know, writing these SQL statements is nice in that you can get the database to do all the work for you of finding all these different pieces of data together and sort of merging them together and, and delivering to you. Um, but it does have some drawbacks uh, in that, you know, like performance, for instance, can be very variable, right? Like this could be very fast or it could be kind of slow. It depends a lot on, you know, how much data you have to go through, what kind of queries you're asking of your database, um, you know, exactly how your data is structured and, and so on and so forth, right? Um, that is SQL in a very overly simplified nutshell. I only got 40 minutes. Uh, in a NoSQL world, um, there, there's a few differences. For starters, uh, things tend to be a little more loosey-goosey in terms of how your data is defined, or I guess to use a, a more formal term, we like to say it is schemaless, which means that by convention, um, a lot of your data, a lot of your records for your data will probably look similar, but there's no hard and fast rules around it, right? Like, um, you know, yeah, sure, every animal here has a name, but that's just by convention. The database isn't really enforcing that. Um, and you know, this is nice, and then it gives you some flexibility, right? Like, if you want to add a field, like, you can. I can add a birthday field here for, for my dog and not worry about adding a birthday field for my fish because, you know, I don't care. It's a fish. No, no one cares about a fish's birthday. Um, and you know, developers generally like this because it does give them the freedom to kind of start adding data as needed. You know, I don't have to worry about how am I going to backfill this birthday field into all my other animals because, again, I don't care about my fish's birthday, right? 
Um, this also lets you, you know, store similar but not exactly alike data. For instance, I can store a plumage field for my bird and a hair type field for my dog and a fin count field for my fish and not have to worry about sort of putting these fields in other records where, you know, they might not make a whole lot of sense. Now, the flip side of all this is that you do have to code defensively. Um, you can never really be guaranteed as to what kind of data you're going to be getting back from the database and you should, you know, fail elegantly if things don't meet your expectations. But honestly, if you're building mobile apps where you know, your user might have a version of your app that's like a year old because they refuse to update, this should be you know, sort of general practice that you're following anyway. Never make assumptions about the data you're getting. But I think the biggest difference with a NoSQL database is kind of, if you can tell, it's sort of a hidden message right there in the name. There's NoSQL. So queries tend to be a lot simpler. So again, going back to like our SQL example, imagine I had you know, some tables of books and some tables of authors, and if I wanted to get a list of books and the names of the people who wrote them, I would do that with some kind of join statement. But in the NoSQL world, you don't have access to these joins. So sort of strictly relying on kind of foreign keys like this, that's kind of you know, foreign. Um, this is not something you would be able to get you know, in one database call. So I think a more likely scenario would actually be to, to duplicate some of that data. You know, um, take the author name and from these little author records and also put them in the book records um, so that they're grouped together um, in, in basically ways where you know you're going to want to retrieve them together. Now this practice, this duplicate of, you know, duplicating of data is known as denormalizing data, um, which I know is a bad and scary thing for a lot of SQL developers because, you know, we've been told ever since we were like, we taught designing our first database that like denormalized data is a really bad thing, right? Like you're really only supposed to have your data in one location so that it's easy to change later, right? You only have to change it in that one spot. But in the NoSQL world, Denormalized data is not only allowed, it's, it's expected. And so yes, you know, if Charles Dickens were to change his name to like, you know, Chuck E. D to stay relevant for the kids, um, I would need to go back and change it everywhere in my database, not just there in the author record, but in those book records where that, that duplicate data lives. And yeah, OK, that's kind of a pain. But there are good reasons for doing this. One reason is that you know, reads are, are, are really easy now. If I want to grab all books along with the names of the authors who wrote them, I can just do that. Right? It's just there, and it's really easy for me to kind of sweep up all that data. And think about it. Realistically, how often is your data being read versus being written? Like, you know, depending on how popular my book app is, those records might be you know, getting read in thousands or millions of times. How often is Charles Dickens changing his name? Like, once? Never, right? And so the NoSQL philosophy is kind of, hey, you know what? Let's actually optimize for the case that's happening thousands or millions of times in the real world instead of the case that's kind of happening once. Um, another big reason NoSQL databases are set up this way, and yes, I am oversimplifying, but it makes it easier for, for us to scale horizontally. Meaning that you know, as your database needs to grow, as you add more and more data to your database, well, you can basically just kind of throw other machines at it and your data will sort of automatically grow to span across these multiple machines. And it all just kind of works. Particularly in like a managed server environment, like say a Google Cloud Platform, it makes it really easy for us to just kind of flip on and flip off servers as your database grows and shrinks. And you know, we can accommodate your data without you ever knowing that we're you know, doing any of this work behind the scenes to make sure you know, we're, we're, we're adding room to expand. Now, by contrast, SQL databases that you know, often have these tight interrelated joins, they tend to scale vertically, meaning that you know, as your database grows um, and you need to accommodate it, you generally have to move it onto like, bigger and beefier machines. And you know, at some point, you're going to run out of massive supercomputers to put that thing on. But also, generally speaking, every time you migrate your database to another machine, um, you know, th there's going to be downtime. And, and we don't like downtime. So uh, NoSQL databases come in a lot of different flavors. You've got like just sort of big key value stores. You've got big old JSON objects like the old real-time database. Um, but Cloud Firestore is about documents and collections, so I'm going to spend a little time looking at these. Let's look at a document first. A document is something you can think of as like a dictionary or a hash. Uh, it's got a set of key value pairs, which we like to refer to as fields. And the values of these fields can be a number of different things, anything from like strings to numbers to you know, very small binary objects to these JSON-y looking things that we officially call maps. 
Now, documents are stored in collections, which are, as, as you might suspect, collections of documents. Now, documents cannot directly contain other documents, but they can and often do point to subcollections, which contain other documents, which then point to other subcollections, and so on and so forth. Uh, now, one important thing to note in Cloud Firestore land is that queries are shallow, meaning that you can, I can grab this document in the top and not worry about grabbing all that data underneath it that you know, are in all those subcollections. Um, and this is generally nice. Developers generally like this because it means that you can structure your data hierarchically in a way that sort of might make sense to you intuitively without having to worry about sort of grabbing a ton of unnecessary data if I just want you know, that document on top. The next thing we should probably cover are queries and how they work. Um, queries in Cloud Firestore are interesting in that, as a general rule, they, they are quite fast. And as a general rule, they scale proportional to the size of the result set not the size of the underlying data set. And uh, what do I mean by that? I mean that if I were to run a query that were, that's asking for, say, the top 10 pizza restaurants in San Francisco, that query is going to take the same amount of time whether I have, like, you know, 1,000 records to look through in my database or 100 million, right? No matter how large that underlying data set is, that query is going to take me the same amount of time. So how does Cloud Firestore do this? by indexing every field in every document in every collection. So uh, thinking about like our, our fake restaurant delivery app a little more, imagine you know, we start having some restaurants represented as documents here, and we put them in some kind of restaurants collection. Well, you notice each one of my restaurants has a field for name and cuisine and city and rating. Well, if I do that, Cloud Firestore is going to go ahead and create an index for every name and every cuisine and every city, and every rating in that collection. Now, all these indexes are created automatically for me by Cloud Firestore whenever I add, change, or delete a document. And now I can search for these documents um, in this collection as long as I can follow this two-step rule, which is step one, um, find a spot in the index where some condition is true, and then basically grab a bunch of adjacent documents until that condition is no longer true. So uh, this, let's go into a concrete example here. Imagine I wanted to find all restaurants in Dallas. Well, that would be easy. I would find my city index and, using this two-step procedure, find where city equals Dallas, and then grab all the adjacent documents until city no longer equals Dallas. Similarly, finding all restaurants with a rating of like 4.5 or more, you know, I could do that. Find that spot in the index, grab all the adjacent documents until, I guess in this case, I run out of documents. Uh, I should probably also note, by the way, that um, map fields, the JSONy looking things, you can query those fields the same way as any other field, right? If, if my address is set up like this, um, Cloud Firestore essentially looks at this as saying, like, I have a field for address.street and address.city and address.zip, and it will go ahead and index those uh, map fields the same way it would any other, any other field. Um, two other features that I'm not going to get into, just in the interest of time. Um, you can query across multiple fields. So I could say, hey, find me all Mexican restaurants in San Francisco with a rating of four or more. Um, you can also query documents that have arrays that contain certain values. So you know, if I have a, a flags um, you know, field that has an array that, that contains a bunch of um, you know, elements about that restaurant, I could perform a search that says, hey, find me all restaurants that serves alcohol or takes reservations. But again, I think the biggest takeaway is remember that every field is indexed, and every query kind of has to follow this two-step procedure. I think it partly explains why things work so fast, but it also might explain why some things that, that seem like should be possible aren't really. Like, like ORs, right? I can't say, hey, find me all restaurants in you know, Chicago or San Francisco, right? That doesn't follow this two-step procedure. Uh, similarly, I couldn't say, you know, find me all restaurants that, where you know, the city doesn't equal Dallas. Um, you can't get sort of the same performance guarantees using those types of queries as you could with this two-step process. And again, you know, because we're sort of fetching your, your results in real time, we want all these queries to be fast. So uh, with all that in mind, let's start thinking a little more about our food delivery app and uh, how we might want to organize some of, some of the data. Like, we've already kind of been talking about restaurants, and I can imagine we're going to have customers that are going to want to place orders. Um, and then we're also going to want to talk about the items that each of these restaurants are serving on their menu. So uh, I'm going to continue talking about restaurants and actually that last one as well, because they kind of go together. 
So I think a good start is kind of imagine our restaurants as we've been you know, thinking about them so far. They're going to be documents that are in a collection like this. And you know, our data, it's kind of what we've been thinking about. This actually seems like a pretty good start. Um, obviously, you know, this is a little more simplified than what we would see in a real production app. But you know, I, I, I think we generally get the idea. But the one thing we haven't talked about yet is what should we do about the actual items on the menu? Well, it seems like it'd be pretty easy to convert a menu into like a JSON-y looking thing and make that a map field that we put inside our restaurant document. That seems reasonable. But it could also make it a subcollection, right? If you think about it, each one of these individual menu items, they could easily be their own documents, and I could make that a subcollection of this restaurant. Well, that also seems reasonable. So I have two uh, kind of reasonable looking solutions. What's, what's the right one here? What should I actually, um, you know, which way should I go? Well, I'm going to spend a fair amount of time uh, talking about this because it does bring up um, a few more rules that, that I want to get into. So hooray for more rules, right? Just when you thought a talk on database structures couldn't get any more exciting, I'm going to add in more rules. Uh, so the first one I want to talk about is that documents have limits. There are limits in Cloud Firestore that prevent you from having documents that are too big. Um, specifically, you know, th these are three that you should be worried about. Um, you know, one megabyte in total size of, of your data in a single document, 40,000 index fields, and um, one QPS of sustained doc writes, meaning that you, know, you can have little bursts of you know, writes to a document, but sort of on average, you should only have one write per second to the same document in Cloud Firestore. So um, these are some limits that we put in to kind of make sure that your documents aren't too big, but um, you know, in practice, if we take our menu and we make it you know, part of our restaurant, does that push us into the too big area? Well, let's think about that. So one megabyte doesn't seem like a lot of space, right? Like we're all taking pictures of these slides, and each of those are going to be like four meg or something, right? Um, but remember, we're primarily dealing with text here. And you know, text or numbers or JSON-y looking things, and those don't really take up a lot of space. Like all of Pride and Prejudice could fit into one megabyte. So you know, unless we got like George R. R. Martin writing our menu item descriptions, I think we're probably going to be okay. And then he would kill off all our favorite dishes. Um, Forty thousand index fields. Uh, well, all right, this could be an issue. Remember that um, each one of these fields in my map is going to be indexed. So Cloud Firestore is creating an index for menu.ribs.name and menu.ribs.price and menu.ribs.description. And oh boy, that seems like that could add up. But you know, at the same time, 40,000 is kind of a big number. You know, even if I had 200 items on my menu, you know, I'd have to have like 200 fields for each one of those items you know, to really kind of worry about this limit. So again, we're probably OK. And as for one QPS sustained doc writes, um, I don't think that's really going to be a problem. I can't imagine us you know, updating the price of our menu items more than once in a second. If we do, you know, we, we'd be having problems. Maybe if I had like, a real-time inventory of how many you know, of these dishes our kitchen had available to serve, and I was updating that in real time, then I would worry about this limit. But again, I think sort of in this example, we're probably OK. So you do want to be careful about having documents that are too big, because you are going to run into these limits. Although, in practice, right now, I'm not actually sure that's an issue. So um, let's look at some other rules and see if they can help us make our decision. Rule number two is that you can only fetch documents. So you know how I told you queries aren't shallow? When you grab that top one, you're not going to grab any of the stuff in any of the subcollections underneath? Well, you know, that's part of it. Um, but the flip side is that you cannot retrieve a partial document. You either get the entire document or you get nothing. So you know, if we start putting our entire menu in you know, one big document, that's eh, going to start to get kind of big. And if our client is, you know, one of our users is saying, hey, you know what, give me the top 30 sushi restaurants in Boston, well, you know, our, our database is going to give back the information they probably care about at that time, which is like you know, the name and the delivery fee and their rating and you know, their address, stuff like that, along with everything each one of these restaurants has on their entire menu. And that's probably more information than our user really wants at that moment. And yes, I know a few slides ago I told you that text isn't a big deal compared to stuff like photos. But still, like you're going to have users that are going to be quite sensitive to how much data their app is using, right? particularly in certain parts of the world where data is expensive. You know, in addition, the more data your app is going to use, like the more battery life uh, your, your, your app is going to take up, um, and the slower your app is going to seem, because we have to sort of download all that data before we can show your results. And by the way, if you had a real-time listener set up on these results, then when one of those values changes, we actually send you over the entire document again. So you could kind of see how this could you know, start to be a bad user experience. 
So yeah, you really don't want to send out more data than your user is actually interested in at that time. Now, on the other hand, if we break this up into subcollections, then you know, when I say, hey, you know, show me the top 30 Japanese restaurants in Boston, I'm going to get back just the restaurant information I care about at that time, you know, the name, the address, the rating, and so on, but not any of the menu items. Right? Later on, when I say, oh, you know what? You know, Izzy's Izikaya looks really good. Let's see what they have on their menu. Well, then and only then can we fetch those other documents from the database. And that's a lot better from, from a data usage standpoint. Right? We're only sending our users the information they care about at that time. So does that make our subcollections um, solution clearly the winner? Well, hang on, because we've got more rules to go through. Ah, more rules. Rule number three is that billing is mostly based on the number of documents that you touch. So um, Cloud Firestore pricing involves several different factors, but I guess it's primarily driven by sort of the number of documents that you're interacting with. You know, specifically, you're going to get charged like three to six cents for every 100,000 reads you perform, and you know, similarly for, for writes and deletes. And so you sort of want to think about the number of different documents you're going to be interacting with. So if I ask for the top 30 sushi restaurants in Boston, and everything is sort of in one giant document like this, well, you know, I'll get billed for 30 document reads. Even if later on I say, OK, well, let's see what's on the menu for one of these, you know, um, we've got that data loaded up locally. And you know, assuming we've kept it around and haven't discarded it, well, now we can show you the menu for one of these without incurring any additional reads. So that seems nice. On the other hand, if I were to load up 30 documents, or you know, the, the top 30 restaurants in Boston, and then say, OK, let's see what's on the menu for one of these, well, now I'm getting billed for that sort of initial batch of 30 reads, and then that second batch of you know, 25 reads or whatever to get what's on the menu. So is this bad? Well, the answer is it depends. Like specifically, if you think about most food delivery apps, you're generally looking at sort of a list of restaurants first, and then maybe after you found one that you're interested in, clicking through to get, you know, get the full menu, then probably place an order from there. Which means that each one of these reads is a, or these sets of reads is a manual action. Meaning that realistically, your user will be doing this maybe like, you know, a few times per session, but probably not hundreds or thousands of times. Now, on the other hand, if we really said, you know, if we really wanted to like, load up the full menu every time we did a search of restaurants, or we thought, hey, you know what, we'll be clever and start preloading all our menu items every time our user performs a search, well, OK, now with one single user action, we're grabbing not just you know, all the restaurant documents, but all the menu items in all the subcollections of all these restaurant documents. Um, and that is going to be bad, right? Like, this is the situation you probably want to avoid. So you do kind of need to stop and ask yourself, like, what is your app actually doing and make the right call from there? And sometimes when I give this advice, people get mad. They're like, why don't you just tell me what the one right answer is? Um, but I think you know, the point is, there isn't always one right answer in every situation. You kind of have to understand what the trade-offs are and make the right call based on how your app is actually behaving. Um, so in our case, even though we are going to be making more document reads with this subcollection, I'm still OK with it. Because like I said, sort of each one of those sets of reads is a manually driven action. Um, you know, be careful about over-optimizing for price. I've seen you know, sort of some really strange solutions out there where people are like, too focused on pricing, and they end up sort of either creating a bad user experience or creating a lot more work for themselves. Um, if you really want like, one right answer, one rule of thumb, I would say you know, generally have one collection per table view controller slash you know, activity slash page. Right? So like in our app, if we have like our, our list of restaurants, our restaurant search page, that's one view controller. That's going to be driven by the restaurants collection. Later when I say, OK, let's see details, what's on their menu, that's going to be then driven by another subcollection. So if you really want one, one right answer, one collection per you know, view controller slash activity. Um, but hang on, because we're not done yet. There's still one more rule to talk about. <gasps> and that's uh, query search for index fields across a collection. So we kind of talked about queries earlier. Um, so if I were to say, hey, find me the top 30 restaurants in Dallas, well, I could do that with either one of these setups, right? Whether our restaurants are larger documents or smaller documents with these subcollections. Either way, the, this query works. But what do I do if I say, hey, I'm in the mood for chicken tikka masala? Can I do that with either one of these setups? Hmm. Well, let's start by taking a look at the bigger documents. As you recall, every field in, in a document 
even the ones in these map are indexed. So you know, looking at our menu here as stored as a giant JSON-y looking thing, um, you can see that I'm going to have an index for menu.cormalam.name. And so you know, it kind of looks like you know, looking at something like that, looking at what I have for menu.ctm.name, I could kind of search for restaurants that serve chicken tikka masala, right? Um, and I would do that by saying, OK, you know, let's find restaurants where this menu.ctm.name field um, exists. Honestly, I don't actually really care about the value. As long as you know, that, that field exists, they probably serve chicken tikka masala. But the problem here is that I'm essentially relying on every restaurant menu having the same key name for that dish. The fact that I actually don't care what the name of the dish is is kind of a red flag. Right? If, if Raj's restaurant were to use a different key for that JSON object that it's using to represent chicken tikka masala, well, now that search, you know, that's, that dish is not going to show up in my original search. I'm essentially relying on this weird secret hidden information that every dish has to kind of have the same key name in my JSON object. And that's going to be kind of weird and error prone. And so I don't, I'm not a big fan of this solution. This is where it seems like subcollections would be a simpler and sort of more natural solution, right? Like, if I look at every one of these documents representing an item on my menu, well, I can see that each one of these has its own set of values, right? And I would have traditional indexes on each of them. And you know, searching by name now seems a lot more natural. I could say, oh, OK, you know, find me items in this collection where the name equals chicken tikka masala. Problem is, you know, this only searches in one collection, right? I can do it for Kieran's restaurant. I cannot do it across all collections. Until now. <gasps> Big gasp. Yeah. All right. So this is where collection group queries can help. Um, this is a feature that I know we've been talking about for a while. And um, I'm happy to say you can all play with it like this week. So um, basically, the way it works is you go to the Firebase console, and you would tell Cloud Firestore about the queries you might want to make across multiple collections. So uh, in this case here, you can see I'm basically saying, OK, out of all the, men out of all the collections called menu items, um, I want you to find this field called name. And I want you to index it in this collection group scope. And that, what that basically means is I want you to index the name field across all menu items collections anywhere they, they exist in my database, right? Index it as if it were just one giant collection. And so that's what Cloud Firestore is going to do, right? It's going to look at every collection with the same name and index that name field as if it was one giant collection, which then means I have a name index that looks at all of these documents in all these different subcollections, which then means that I can query that collection group to find all restaurants that serve chicken tikka masala, even though they are now split into different subcollections. Uh, so going back to sort of our, our original dilemma of do we want to have larger documents or subcollections, um, I think given the advantages that we get of putting them in subcollections, you know, specifically, you know, we don't have to worry about hitting that, that theoretical larger document limit. Um, we're much more respectful of our, our users' data. And you know, we can now search for menu items by name by creating a collection group query. Um, this is going to be my winner. Yes, you know, the bigger documents will still give me fewer reads. But like I said before, you know, be careful about over-optimizing for price. Like, you kind of want to make sure you're not going to do anything that's going to be catastrophically bad. But like, if you're trying to wring out every last cent of your, you know, of your database usage, um, that might actually be, be spent, better spent on other things. All right, so let's switch gears for a little bit and think about how we might want to store our users, our, you know, the, our customers who are placing orders. So this seems like a pretty obvious candidate to sort of put everything in a top-level collection. That seems fairly straightforward, right? And we've got, you know, we can store like their name and their delivery address and their profile picture, like maybe some of their favorite foods. And you know, this all seems very reasonable. I like this. And then one day, our product manager comes in with a fantastic idea. Hey, you know what we should do? We should make this thing social, right? Like, let's have our users find friends in their local area who like the same kind of food as them. It'd be great. They can get together. They can order out food together. And you know, now we've become a food delivery slash dating app, right? Sounds, sounds good to me. And you know, this is a query that we could pretty easily create um, you know, in, in our setup, right? Like, we could say, hey, let's find everyone in San Francisco where their you know, favorites array contains Korean food. And just like that, we found folks in our city who like Korean food. So what's the problem here? Clearly, I'm leading us to some kind of problem. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a very interesting presentation. It's this rule here, right? Remember, you can only fetch documents 
not partial documents. And so when you know, our, some of our random users are getting you know, a list of people in their city who like Korean food, we're finding out all sorts of stuff about them, right? Like their name and also where they live. And, oh, crap. Well, that's bad. Can't imagine anything getting worse than, oh, crap. Right? Like now we know where all these people live and how to break into their house. And this is, this is bad. Um, and sure, you know, you're probably smart enough that you're not showing this data on the client, um, but that doesn't matter, right? The fact that this data is getting sent over means that a sufficiently motivated hacker could get at this data, and all of a sudden you've you know, leaked all your users' you know, addresses and how to get into their front gate. So there are definitely other options we should be considering here. Um, you know, one option, just put your addresses into a subcollection, right, where we keep that information. That's nice, too, because now we can add you know, multiple addresses per user. Um, and then you know, we can make sure that like, only our delivery people have access to that when they need it. Um, you know, if we had like, payment information or anything else that we might want to keep private, we could store that in like, a private info subcollection. Um, on the other hand, if we actually think, hey, you know what? We might be storing a lot of information about our users in these documents, we could also flip this on its head right? and have a public profile subcollection for each one of our users. Um, I like this because this basically, you know, can say, we can say that everything in our user document is private by default until we explicitly take a copy of that data and put it into the public profile. And, you know, that, that sort of prevents a lot more accidental leaking of data. And I know I haven't spent a lot of time talking about security rules yet, um, but when it comes to preventing unauthorized access, uh, both this approach and the approach on the previous slide are nice because it's generally easier to sort of have different access levels at different collections. So being able to say, hey, you know what, in this user's collection, you know, users can only read the user document that belongs to them, but hey, these public profile subcollections, those are open for, you know, any logged in user to read. Um, that, kind of, that kind of setup is generally easy to do. Um, using security rules, right? Having sort of different security setups for different collections, that's kind of how security rules work. All right, so let's move on to the uh, last data object we're going to tackle, and that's orders. Um, this is kind of interesting because it combines data from a lot of different places, right? We're going to have some elements unique to the order itself, like the time the order was placed and the delivery fee and probably a few other things. Um, and then we're going to have information about our user, their name, you know, where to uh, send the food. We're going to have information about the restaurant itself, like you know, where to place the order, where our courier needs to go to pick up the dishes. And then, yes, we're going to have you know, the menu items that our user has ordered, right? Like, what was it? How much did it cost? They ask for it extra spicy or, or hold the mayo. And again, if we were looking at this from more of like a SQL background, we'd probably think of it you know, something like this. We might have like a little bit of order-specific information, and then kind of foreign keys to represent um, all these other bits of information. And then we would do some kind of big old join before sending this information off to, to a restaurant to kind of process the order. But you know, again, we don't live in a SQL world. We are a NoSQL database that's got super fast reads and horizontal scalability and all that great stuff, but no fancy joins. So this is probably sort of not the default way we want to think about sort of storing this order. Instead, we're just going to build the document with the data that we need at the time. So when our user places an order, we'll create a document storing that you know, order-specific data, um, copy over the relevant user information that we'll need you know, from, from our user document, copy over whatever you know, relevant restaurant information we need, and then also add in the food that they're ordering. And this actually is a case where I would recommend adding all the items directly to the order in a you know, big array like this or a map um, instead of putting it into a subcollection. Because if you kind of think about it, anybody who's sort of reviewing their orders, whether it's like a user looking at past orders or like you know, a restaurant looking at open orders they need to process, they're probably going to want to see this menu information you know, alongside their orders. So again, kind of stop and think, what is my app actually doing? And you know, make the call from there. And yeah, I know it is still a little strange to kind of see this duplicate data in our records. Um, but you know, if this is still kind of weirding you out, um, one of our engineers had a really nice analogy, which is like, instead of sort of just thinking of this denormalized data as like denormalized data, like this data in your database really is like your real-time API for your app. Like if you were to make an API for your app that's like, you know, order, you know, get order, you'd basically sort of be generating a JSON-y looking object that would look an awful lot like this. 
And so kind of the, the whole idea maybe with a lot of NoSQL databases and with Cloud Firestore is like, well, you know, maybe just look at that data that as you know, the, the, this API, this you know, real-time API for fetching orders, and that really is the data that you're going to store in your database. So um, if that actually helps you sort of get your mind around NoSQL databases a little better, um, use that. If, on the other hand, that just confused you further, then forget I said anything. So uh, where this orders collection actually goes in our database, eh, it kind of depends. And honestly, I don't, I don't care too much. Like, you can make this a subcollection of a restaurant, or you know, make it a subcollection of our users, or even make it another separate top-level collection. Honestly, kind of any one of these situations um, is, is fine with me. Um, you know, now that collection group queries are working, you could basically sort of query for any of these orders by you know, the restaurant, or the courier, or the user. Um, and you know, they, they would all work just fine. So I would say kind of pick any one of these architectures that sort of first popped into your mind intuitively, because that's probably the right one. Um, I actually don't want to spend a lot of time on this decision, because uh, I do want to go back to the duplicate data, right? Because um, we do need to ask ourselves, what do we do if one of these values later changes? How can we make sure that that gets updated in our order? Well, in some cases, maybe the answer is, eh, we don't want to do anything. Right? Like, imagine that a few days after Diana places her order, you know, Troy decides to raise the price of their bibimbap. Well, you know, in this case, it's probably accurate and correct to not actually change that value in her order. Right? Like, we want her order to reflect the price of, of the, the item at the time that she ordered it. So this is actually one situation where I think you know, having this denormalized data kind of works in our favor. But there are play cases where it might make sense. Like imagine that we've done a you know, UX research study, and we realize that when restaurants change their name, we want to make sure that name change does get reflected in the user order because you know, it makes it easier for the user to remember it or, or something like that. right? So when Troy's Tofu Hut changes their name to Troy's Tofu Cabin, well, maybe we do want to change that in our order as well. So how we do that? Well, one option is just have that client make that change you know, everywhere. So um, you know, we've probably got some kind of client app set up for our restaurant owners. right? And we could say, all right, well, when that, you know, when that restaurant owner decides to change the name and change that in the restaurant document, we will also go ahead and you know, do a search through all these orders that belong to this restaurant and make the change there as well. That can work. Um, but it's a little weird to have our client sort of make this big transaction that changes all these orders. Um, you know, for starters, it's a lot of work that we're asking our client to do. And you know, depending on the situation, it also sort of might open up some kind of strange security rule setups, right? Like, you know, now we got to make sure that a restaurant can go ahead and change, you know, the restaurant field or the restaurant name field in the order document, but we probably don't want them like modifying or you know the price of orders or adding more food on to other orders or doing anything nefarious like that. And so you know, this can get a little strange. And so I think in practice, this is something that would be better done with a cloud function. So um, if you don't know what, what cloud functions are, they are a way for you to run server-side code by having functions that execute in response to actions that happen in your app. Like, for instance, someone changes the value in a restaurant document. And because these run server-side, um, they're generally not subject to the same security rules they, they would add you'd have to have for your clients. right? Like These are being run in an environment you trust as opposed to something on you know, some person's phone somewhere. Um, and that means you can generally sort of lock down your security rules a lot more because your cloud functions get to circumvent those security rules. And so I like simple and locked down when it comes to security. It just sort of means you know, fewer things to worry about. So we can create a cloud function that activates when a document in one of our restaurant collections is changed. right? And now our, our restaurant client only has one job, and that's to go ahead and change its name in the restaurant. And then we can rely on the cloud function to notice that change and make the corresponding change in all those orders. And you know, this could really be used um, anywhere that we've got you know, duplicate denormalized data that, that we want to keep in sync. Like, remember how we had like, our users in our public profile? Well, you know, if, we, if, Rebecca, if, if Becca changes her name to Rebecca, and we decide you know, what the right thing to do is sort of always automatically you know, update that value in her public profile as well, that is something we could sort of rely on, on a cloud function to do for us. So hey, wow, all this stuff we were at, uh, at the beginning, I guess it's not so scary after all, which is nice. Um, but I know that was a lot of information to throw at you. Uh, but if you want to learn even more, because it turns out there is a lot more to cover, uh, I have a series on the Firebase YouTube channel called Get to Know Cloud Firestore, where, uh, yes, take pictures of that. 
That's, this is the most important thing to take a picture of. Um, where I cover all this in even more excruciating detail. Um, but I also have cute cartoon characters, because you know, when you think of lectures involving databases, you think cute cartoon characters. They just, they just go together. Uh, don't forget to rate the session if you liked it. Um, if you didn't like it, uh, my name was Rado Meyer, and I was talking about Android Studio. Um, and with that, I'm going to say, if you have any further questions, I'll be hanging out in the Firebase Dome for like another hour. Um, I hope you all learned something. Thank you very much. And now go out and have a great rest of the conference. Thank you.